Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. Welcome back to Adventure Capital, where we not only discuss the entrepreneurial journeys and adventures with founders who have raised capital on WeFunder, but also the different resource providers and mentors helping founders along the way. Huzzah! In this interview, we chat with Kelsey Moreira, fearless founder and chief dope dealer at Dope. The Shark Tank Grayson, scrumptiously delightful and rapidly exploding edible cookie dough startup. Before we get on with the podcast, we're required to let everyone know that anything we say here should not be interpreted as investment advice, recommendations, or soliciting investments in any company. All companies raising on WeFunder are given an equal opportunity to participate in the podcast based on the progress of their campaign. WeFunder gang gang take it away awesome welcome everyone to this episode of the pod this is our first ever edition of we funder stars where are they now uh with kelsey marrera founder and ceo of dope um kelsey welcome welcome to the pod love it happy to be here good to see some friendly faces it's nice to be here or with welcome you guys. welcome back i should say you were on with us a few months ago now after your we funder campaign you guys raised just over 167K from 152 investors in the earlier days of WeFunder and uh, successfully have repaid your revenue share. So congrats to you guys. Huge congrats are in order. Thank you. Yeah, it was a big weight off my shoulders to know that it was done and paid back and like really nice for the investors to know that they did, made the right choice and invested in a company that's really taking off. Totally. Cool. So yeah, to, to kick us off, can you give us a, an overview and a reminder of uh, what Dope is and what you're working on? Yeah, 100%. And that's even kind of part of the evolution since I was first on WeFunder to what Dope is growing to be today. Um, Dope is an indulgent dessert platform to try and break the stigma around mental health and addiction recovery. Our first line of products was edible and bakeable cookie dough. We've taken a few formats for that. So scooping it out of a pint or eating uh, portion control bites from our dope drops and uh, looking forward to the next few years as we roll out across the indulgent dessert category, but all with the kind of heart and mission at the forefront. So, Kelsey, I remember um, I just looked on your campaign page that you, you closed in September 2018, which is so insane. That was like three and a half years ago. It feels to me like yeah. it was yesterday. <laughs> um, and I remember seeing you go on Shark Tank, which I, I think, I still think your Shark Tank pitch was like one of the best I have ever seen. And I love the back and forth with Mark Cuban when he like passed because it wasn't healthy. And then he invested <laughs> in like the fat yeah. guy's burger shop like the next week. <laughs> um, yes. And you just yes. called him out for it on social, which was awesome. But uh <laughs> Polite. Yeah, that was yeah, so good. <laughs> so good. Yeah. But, um, it's it's been so cool to kind of follow the the story um from afar, but people listening probably haven't haven't had that um that seat uh for the for the journey. So it would be really cool for you to just give us an update of okay, since that time, September 2018, yeah. goodness, three and a half years, that's a long time. What's uh what's been going on with dope uh in that time? Totally. Yeah, it's so funny. It does feel like it was yesterday, but also 10 years ago, you know, like because yeah. so much life has happened. And yeah. I mean, the business has taken so many twists and turns and I really tried to like stay as nimble as we could. Um, the pandemic was a big shift for us, too. So if you think back to the business, when I went on WeFunder originally, very focused on our brick and mortar storefronts. Right. So we had scoop shops. It was like, let's get maximum brand awareness being in these tourist locations and have people come through and really get an in-person like memorable experience with dope Vision as like Wolf a in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, Pier 39 and SF. And then also on the Las Vegas strip. And, um, you know, that store in Vegas opened in March of 2019 and our shark tank episode aired in May of 2019. So it was great timing because we had gone on mm-hmm. trying to raise money to open that store, um, from the sharks. And as you mentioned, declined because uh, cookie dough wasn't healthy for you. And I'm sitting there like, but it's dessert. Like we can all indulge in a little bit of dessert and uh, feel good about it. It doesn't have to be, I'm not saying to eat cookie dough for every meal. I won't be mad at you if you do, but it's not, not the main thing. So declined by the sharks, but I got another investor a couple months later and ended up opening that store on the strip. So um, really amazing to see it come to life. But 
late 2019 started focusing on e-commerce. My husband joined the company then as well. So I got married and uh, was like, hey, also you should run this business with me. And now we're (laughs) co-CEOs and dope. Um, He was like really instrumental in saying, let's get super focused. Like our mantra was 2020 is going to be the year of focus because we were doing way too many things like catering, Mm. a little bit of wholesale, a little bit of e-commerce. We had the storefronts. And all of them had very different operational complexities and very different um, impacts on the PL. So we were like, let's get really focused and just do e-commerce and our storefronts. And for anybody who went through 2020, like focusing on e-commerce in late 19 was the best decision we could have ever had. Yeah. So we went from like $50,000 of our sales in 19 uh, were from online and 2.5 million in our sales uh, from 2020 were online. So Wow. It became this like massive shift, wow. you know, more than doubled our business, um, but ended up closing down the entire brick and mortar business by October of 20 and mm-hmm. had to make that decision of like the emotional Kelsey, who's like, oh, I put my like heart and soul into the storefront. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. Like I had to just be like, what do the numbers tell you and what's the right thing for the business? Close the store and like really focus on scaling that and uh, grew it to a $4 million D2C business last year. So um, it was the right choice, even if it was painful. I shed a few tears. Um, it was hard to let it go, but it was the right call. So big shift in the time since our We Thunder campaign. It's a whole whole new dope. And the new frontier with us scaling into retail is really how we make dope a household name. So we've just launched at Walmart. Um, in 10 days, we'll be on shelves at Costco. So I'm really, wow. really excited for what's to come. That's dangerous. A Costco-sized <laughs> tub of dope. Yes, Watch we're talking out. like two pound bag of this. So it'll be our dope drops, the snackable and bakeable okay. bites. Um, so yeah, it's a two pound bag going to Costco uh, across the entire Texas region, all 41 warehouses. So super excited. It's like a real, you know, Costco in any region is such a national stage for a brand to step into and a big, um, yeah, just like a big moment for us. So big proving ground. We'll see what happens and excited to see where we are in a year from now. For sure. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Your marketing has always been super strong across all of these channels, which I'm sure like kind of carries its weight and helps you make a really big splash when you do launch. But can you talk about some of the other challenges that you may have experienced shifting from, you know, your core presence with the in-person storefronts to now, you know, e-commerce? I imagine there was like a learning curve yeah. with each of those and now with retail. Yeah, it's like, it's such an interesting evolution. And there's pros and cons. I think going from Mm -hmm. a few years of like an in person experience into e commerce, I had so much more data than the average CPG company has about like, what flavors sell the best? What are the most common questions from customers? You know, like I could rattle off the top five things someone asks Mm -hmm. when they walk up to the dope shop. So when they walk up to our virtual shop, which is our website, what information do I need to put at the forefront? You know, all of that came a lot quicker than I think the sort of bumps and learning you have to do if you're just launching an e-commerce for your first go round to see if like, do people even like this product? Like, do they get the brand? Like, what do they, what do they want to know? And um, we had a lot of those questions answered. So I do think there was a lot of help there. The operational like road bumps of having to scale so quickly into the fulfillment side of it was like really something like I almost, you know, that's one of the, like, we almost died. (laughs) It was so, so stressful. Like, uh, there was one period of time where Iz had to go to the store. We're working graveyard shifts. I was able to go back, had meetings the next day, like through the day. He had to stay like the GM for the store didn't show up. So he had to work a shift in the store and then work the graveyard shift again for all the packing for fulfillment. So oh it was like trying to go through that. And this is, you know, late February, early March, mid-March hits in 2020. And we had to shut down the store, which is where we were doing fulfillment. So with 24 hours notice, we had to find where we were going to move our fulfillment to, like what we were producing the dough and packing all the orders overnight, every night. So it was like, there's no time to waste. Like we had to find somewhere else to go and found a donut shop in Vegas that let us like literally get a U-Haul and drive over that day on, I think it's like, you know, the 18th or 17th of March is like just the scarring day in my memory. (laughs) We made it happen. And like, we didn't miss a single day's um, shipment during that. And quickly had to move to external fulfillment, went through our own learning curve there. And um, yeah, we're finally at a really healthy place with a fulfillment center and co-packer and um, production on direct to consumer is moving smooth. That's really cool. Um, 
we help founders raise capital here at WeFunder, as you know. So we're always really interested in the, the capital um, journeys of founders. And normally on, on these podcasts, we're talking about, okay, before WeFunder and then kind of on WeFunder. Um, but for you, it's again, it's been three and a half years since WeFunder. Um, you mentioned like you, you found an investor to, to uh, when you moved into the Vegas um, storefront. Have you raised additional outside capital or you've, or you've been kind of growing through through revenue and profitability over the last few years? I will answer that, but there's a weed whacker like right outside my window. <laughs> I, I know it's going to kill you guys on the audio side, so we'll let you <laughs> chop this part out. He's just like, now's a good time to do the bushes immediately outside of Kelsey's window. Well, Can I've got, a bunch, of, I've got a bunch no? of very loud colleagues uh, mucking around <laughs> in the background. So uh, oh, you know, good. We're, we're I can't even. hear it. I actually oh. can't hear it either. Yeah, you guys are good. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I was like, this is excessive. But if you can't hear it, that's what matters. Um, yeah. So capital raised for dope. Um, one of the wild things about switching business channels relatively rapidly and having to, you know, pivot, um, though for the right decision, it, it did make a lot of my capital investments in the early days sort of get washed away, right? Like the money we had put into um, these storefronts ended up not being needed. So uh, half of the money Dope has raised to date was for our brick and mortar stores. So we've actually grown the business we have today with about a million dollars of investment. So I've since uh, WeFunder, since Shark Tank kind of timing, in total raised uh, $2 million uh, for the company since its inception. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty remarkable that we've been able to like make it to where we are with the, with the limited capital in the grand scheme of CPG um, and with having to yeah adjust business focuses kind of along the way. Um, private investor that's helped us to date. And um, we've had fun news from the WeFunder world. Uh, we had, uh, I think it's been, Five in total, five of them came back to invest again after we just repaid back our uh, WeFunder repayment plan. It was a debt plan, so there wasn't equity in it. And uh, we've had five investors from that come back and put in additional That's capital on their own. What did we a agree convertible was be our uh, commission on that again? Was yeah. It, uh, <laughs> That's a new... follow-on investing. I think you said that back in 2018, right? Uh, yeah, new yeah, new contract <laughs> edition you guys are going to throw in there. <laughs> no, it's great, though. It's like WeFunder really wasn't... A, a, testing ground for them where like they got to invest Ooh. and see, whoa, she really like does what she says she's going to do. We kept updating investors along the way through the WeFunder um, platform and, and letting them know the good and the bad, like getting them along for the ride when like things were just absolutely amazing, big wins we were having and being super authentic and true to our core to say when stuff was hitting the fan and, you know, we were mm -hmm. having to make hard decisions and we kind of shared all of that very openly. So when it, came through and came to it's like all these years later here you go we've paid it back um it's really nice to see some of them say i want in again you know can i can i be a part of this for the long haul and um come in with some equity so yeah very nice for sure yeah and i remember you know back in 2018 i remember sitting in the upstairs room at the office in san francisco chatting with you about the raise and and what it could look like and you were kind of toying between doing something like equity, I think maybe convertible note, and then revenue share, you ultimately went with the rev share. And for those listeners who aren't super familiar, it's a debt structure. So um, you commit to paying back a percentage of your revenues each quarter um, until your investors make a multiple on their initial investment. So like 1.5x, 2x. Um, and they're not as common on WeFunder, but they really do work. And, um, you know, it depends on the growth strategy that you have. So uh, Kelsey, can you talk a little bit more about your thought process behind wanting to do the rev share versus an equity type contract? And also now looking back, like, are you, I mean, you preserved equity, yeah. right? So you have more equity mm -hmm. than you've given that up as, as equity. So are you looking back, do you think that was a good structure to have used? Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly a no regrets kind of personality where I feel like every decision you make is, you know, leading to where you're supposed to be. So I, um, you know, I don't necessarily regret it. I think with the information I have now with how critical cash is to keep growing, to keep putting cash into marketing the business, to keep putting cash into growing the business, the staff, the retention efforts, everything you're doing, the money is just every dollar is so, so valuable for a startup and having to commit, I think our remittance, something like, um, I want to say it's 12%, it was 12% of revenue, having to go back to paying off the debt um, was very challenging, particularly in times where cash flow was super tight 
where um, we'd been making these pivots where things didn't materialize like we thought they might have. And still at the end of the day, end of the quarter, you've got to make that payment for um, the, the percent of your revenue. And um, had I done, you know, a, a safe agreement or something like that back in the day, um, I think I would have been in a better, better cash position than we wound up in it at certain times through this. So um, I would just recommend any founders that are looking into doing a crowdfunding raise, like find five, six people who are many steps ahead of you in the fundraising journey and entrepreneurial journey and ask for their advice on what they think is, you know, advisable for your stage and for your growth path um, and plans. It's really easy when you're just starting off to think like, oh, but it's my equity, like I don't want to share it. And, you know, you can have a lot of equity of a very small pie, or you can have a little bit of a very, very big pie. And it will vary based on how much capital you're willing to take in and equity you're willing to give away. And um, it's just this sort of like yo-yo game you have to play as an entrepreneur with how quickly do you want to grow and um, being smart about ownership retention to not lose control of your business, but uh, to know that you can go faster with other people's capital um, if you're willing to kind of uh, let that a little bit loose. So don't raise money you don't need. There's no reason to go out and do a crowdfunding raise for like $8 million if you're just getting off the ground. Um, that would be silly and you'd give away a whole bunch of your company. So just be really smart and intentional about the money you're raising and um, not be afraid to give up some equity along the way. That's a really good, wise uh, perspective. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, wise. I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, whatever in the startup younger, years. Whatever the younger. So a few gray I hairs have come wiser. in since, yeah. so I'm wiser now than I was. <laughs> um, that's a really hip perspective, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's really cool about the uh, the five in, we fund our investors kind of following on um, as equity investors. And we, yeah, we look forward to uh, yeah, and continuing the conversation about negotiation on the commission that we're going to take on, on those <laughs> investments. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, are there any other kind of stories that you have or what, you know, kind of interactions you had with, uh, with we fund our investors down the years? Um, like you say, you did an awesome job of kind of updating them along the journey. Um, any, any kind of stories or interactions there? Yeah, I mean, I think as a consumable product, really recommend um, this incentive to keep your product in your investors' lives. So giving a discount for them to get it ongoing from our e-commerce site, you know, that only became stronger as we started focusing more on e-commerce. Our offerings were more interesting. The shipping situation was even better, gifting, um, all of that. So at the end of the day, it's uh, 152 uh, customers, you know, who can be excited about your brand and help share it. And any D2C business to really grow into a healthy, profitable state needs to have uh, first time customers coming back and second time customers, but also these customers doing referrals and bringing in, you know, one, two, three additional friends into your, your customer base. So um, I see it as kind of a little follow on waterfall effort. If you can get your investors excited about your product and consuming it and sending it as a gift and all that good stuff, um, it's going to help you in the long run. So that was certainly a nice part of it that they got a, a hefty discount code, you know, to keep ordering it dope and um, be thinking of us when when they had an event or something going on to bring dope to. That's always my my kind of best thinking with perks is like, if you can give a discount, as long as your gross margin can sustain it, right, then like, firstly, it's incentivizing them to come in and hopefully invest a larger amount in the WeFund around. But then also, like, yeah, if you, if you have high, high enough gross margins, then that's going to yeah. drive investment volume, revenue, and even profitability uh, long term. Um, so you're kind of winning, winning on both fronts. And, you know, you see on like on Kickstarter, it's like the t-shirt or the cap or whatever, that's kind of additional log logistical complexity. But if it's like, the e-commerce business that you would be doing anyway. Yeah. Like no additional logistical complexity. Um, so yeah. it, it seems to kind of, um, you know, work on a bunch of levels. So yeah, I always think that the discounts as perks is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Especially with the revenue share. <laughs> They're helping yeah. you help them. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, true. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, yeah, you kind of gave us a sneak peek uh, into my next question. Um, with, you know, being able to find you at Walmart, being able to find you at Costco, but um, can you tell us what's next for Dope for the rest of this year? 
Yeah, 2022, big year for Dope. It's like um, we really spent 2021 like streamlining all of the direct consumer business and making sure operations there were going to be running smooth and starting those conversations in the sales process for retail. And then it's kind of like all hitting at the beginning of this year with things really coming to life. So our launch at Harmon's in Utah was our very first grocery store. Um, we launched our pints there and they are already bringing in our dope drops. So really fun to have a grocery store where we'll get to see like, how does it sell in refrigerated cookie dough and how does it sell in frozen desserts? So um, in the same, you know, same store foot traffic. So it'll be really kind of a fun experiment there to see that go out. And then um, Foxtrot and New Seasons and Walmart, uh, Walmart's California and Nevada. And then Costco is happening. So the, the Texas region for Costco. So i um, super excited to see all this come to life. We've got a few other retailers that can't be named yet, but will be later this year, Q3, Q4, um, and some awesome conversations. We went to our first Expo West this year. So starting a bunch of conversations with uh, some dream opportunities that would be amazing to realize, you know, if not this year, next year. And um, yeah, in our direct consumer business, like getting more focused on the gifting occasions. I think that's a big thing for us this year to really hit when it's time, though, I like if everyone ordered dope for themselves every month, it's kind of like when it's time to send a gift, how do we make dope top of mind for people who have enjoyed it as a sweet treat for themselves and now could think about more times a year that they would would send it. So we're kind of leaning into that. We've had a ton of fun with our sober birthday box, um, getting, you know, as involved as dope is in the recovery community, getting something like tangible to help celebrate recovery and make it an exciting thing. That's been been a super big highlight for me. Um, and I think since we met, you know, 2018 doing the We Funder raise, like Dope for Hope was really in an, in its infancy of like what it would mean mm -hmm. for Dope to try and take a stance around mental health and addiction recovery. And I think that's been um, a real shining light, like over the last even 12 months, it's it's taken even a, a bigger hold and bigger shape on how we have an impact. Um, Dope became a designated recovery friendly workplace last year. So um, we're helping other employees, employers rather, um, know how to support their employees, bring their full selves to work across mental health, addiction recovery, and suicide prevention. Um, it's something I'm super passionate about. We've seen work inside our company and now trying to help others outside. So good stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I love that aspect of the story as well, the kind of the mission and impact side of, of what you're doing. Um, I was talking uh, the other day with Elliot Begin. Um, and he was just talking about the like importance of you know the founders kind of personal brand and narrative and story in the brand of the company and the story of the company in the community mm -hmm. um, and yeah in few companies I feel like is that is that kind of parallel like um, more clearly visible than with you and Dope you're just like such an incredible spokesperson for the brand and just like such a charismatic like you know, leader. I just love like everything you put out um, into the world on social. It's been so fun to follow along with you on the journey. Um, Thank you. One last question. We asked for you for some advice when you came on three years ago, whenever it was. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I can't remember what you said. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully you don't give the same advice again. Uh, or How maybe funny. that will be a good thing because you're just so consistent. Um, but you've probably learned <laughs> some stuff over the last few years. So we, we end these podcasts with uh, the same question, which is to ask for, for one piece of advice that you would, um, that you would have for, for a founder who's following in your illustrious footsteps. I love it. And you don't know what I said last time. I imagine what I'm going to say might be different because I really, I would say it's in the last two years kind of curated like my five pro tips for entrepreneurs. So um, I can lay those down and we'll see if I was Ooh, as wise yeah, I like in that. 2018. <laughs> you see our request for one piece of advice and you raised us five pieces of advice. <laughs> I'm up in the ante. Lay it on. Um, I'll keep it quick. So first thing is to operate as if success is inevitable. This idea that like, you know, without a doubt, you're going to find a way forward. Um, I think this is like when I look at something being an obstacle and instead of that, I'm like, there's just a new path forward. So find a way, like there's just a, this sense in my mind that like, there's nothing that could possibly stop us from hitting the, the end goal and really making dope a household name. Um, next one is to stay focused on what makes you different. It's super easy to listen to everybody else saying, you need to go into keto. You need to do this. You got to be plant-based. You need to go you know, whatever it may be for your product line, like everyone thinks they've got the best idea for you and just really keep it clear in your mind what makes your business different. 
Uh, next up is hire for what you suck at. So it's really easy to try and hoard everything and keep it all on your plate. But as soon as you can, as soon as you're able in the business, like find areas that are not your zone of genius where you're like lighting up and time's flying by and your special sauce. Like if it's not that find someone else to do it, uh, free work, the freelance Upwork stuff, you know, there's so many opportunities to find support that can alleviate you from tasks that aren't really your special sauce. Um, next is never say no to an introduction. I've gotten the most out of the, you know, off the wall kind of recommendations for who I should meet. Um, and I always say like, sure thing, let's do it. 15 minute call and you can spare 15 minutes and you just never know like this person that you didn't initially see any real connection with or why you should know them. They might know the perfect person for what you need or down the road, like, thank goodness you knew them because they have this other connection that they could introduce you to. And um, you just never know. So growing your network is like the most valuable thing you can do as an entrepreneur. Uh, and the last and most important is to be a good human, you know, to do this for more than just you. As you start to build a company, it initially typically begins with like, I have this thing I think other people will like, but just try as I have with dope to see like, how could it serve a bigger purpose? What platform you've created that you could talk about stuff that matters to you and try to make a difference. And it'll make the really hard days a little bit easier to go through when you know you're positively impacting people's lives. Mic drop. That's my five tips. <laughs> yeah. I love these. I love these. I'm like feverishly um, writing them down for my own pearls of wisdom now that I've love it. gotten to be graced with your presence twice on this podcast. And then I'm going to go listen to the, the previous episode, but yeah, um, tell me what my advice was on the previous yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll let you know. We'll let you know. Everyone yeah. should go listen to it. It's a great episode. Um, but Kelsey, thank you so much. This has been really fun. As Johnny said, it's been a total treat, no pun intended, just to follow along with the dope <laughs> uh, growth and, um, you know, stay in touch with you. So really appreciate your time and best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you, guys. Have a dope day. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, thanks. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Adventure Capital. I hope you laughed, took notes, shed a tear, and most importantly, feel ready to go off on your own adventure. And remember, whenever you're ready, WeFunders here to help. Be sure to like and leave a review, gang.